Uh, hello, Morgan. Uh, really enjoyed this film. It's uh, a belated sequel, and it's a really nice film. Um, so my first question, really, for you is, you have an extensive career in award-winning documentaries. So how did this sequel land in your lap? Well, um... Uh, yes, I've made a lot of documentaries uh, and I have a company and we make a lot of documentaries there and so I work on other people's documentaries and I always love documentary. Um, but uh, I made my first foray into feature film, narrative feature film uh, with X plus Y um, about eight years ago. And, you know, if an interesting script comes my way, I'll, I'll, I'd always, uh, you know, I'd always certainly look at it. And... Um, uh, and Danny's script came in, and, and it was a, a relatively early draft, although I think they had been working on it for a while. Um, and there was lots about it that appealed to me. I really liked Danny's style of writing. I really liked the warmth, the humour, the fact that it was still moving, and the kind of adventure and fun of it as well. And then going back to the original film um, and connecting some of those themes with the original uh, and kind of identifying what it was about the original that made it such an enduring classic I think that just helped bind it together so Jenny Agata the return of Jenny Agata so she was in the 68 TV series the 1970 film the 2000 TV film remake and now for a sequel so how have you persuaded her to return to the role again well it's interesting isn't it because you, you mentioned the, the the TV series that came before the Lionel Jeffries film, and then the subsequent um, series as well, where she played the mother. But I, I think for the most part, people just think of Jenny in the original 1970 Lionel Jeffries film. Um, but for her, uh, she, I mean, that it's, it's such an iconic role. And, and when people think of the railway children, they often think of, of Jenny. Um, how much that has followed her around, I'm not sure, because she spent a lot of her her career um, in the States um, and in the States where the film isn't, isn't so well known and I think that was probably quite good and quite healthy <laughs> um, but coming back to it uh, I think um, initially she was approached by Gemma Rogers the producer um, and uh, was sort of tentatively on board and there were various uh, challenges to overcome scheduling wise it, during the pandemic she's on call the midwife couldn't be released from a bubble to come into our bubble and then back into their bubble. Um, but for her, I think it was really important just to understand who her character had become and what had happened to her in the intervening years. Um, and we did talk a lot about that. And um, uh, a lot of uh, what we, kind of suppose, came up with during those conversations made its way into the script. So the fact that she's a suffragette or she was a suffragette, um, uh, we felt that was very in keeping with her very proactive uh, character as a, as a teenager um, and uh, that she would always kind of protest against an injustice. Uh, and that also, for me, uh, made sense when it came to the story of the children in our film who take matters into their own hands um, in a very kind of adult world um, and take risks in order to do that. And to believe that Jenny's character, Bobby, would kind of back and support them in that situation, I think we needed to under understand both her, her past and that, that childhood experience and what she'd been doing um, in the years in between. So you've got Jenny back. The other question now must be Sally Thompson, Bernard Cribbins, uh, even Gary Warren. Was the opportunity maybe to get them into cameos, or was that never a, a, a consideration? Well, it's interesting because, you know, we never um, thought of this. It's certainly not a remake, as you know. It's mm. set 40 years after the original. Um, and to I think there's a balance to be found between, um, uh, you know, a healthy amount of nods and uh, references to, to the original um, and overly cluttering it and being being overly conscious of that because the film has to stand up on its own um, and it has to work for uh, people who haven't seen the original and that would include children, um, lots of children who, who won't have seen the original. Um, and um, so so I think we didn't want to kind of overly, overly clutter it with, with references and there were also issues around people's availability. We did want Bernard to be in the film very much um, he's in his 90s and uh, at the time his wife was very unwell 
um, sadly. Um, and uh, yeah, right up to the wire, we'd hoped that he, he would be able to come and join us. And unfortunately, that wasn't possible. So got to talk about the children. Uh, a lot of children in this, but Eden and Zach, especially, this is their first film, I understand. First anything. Well, yeah. first anything in telly and film. And, yeah, so much. how did you go about finding them and auditioning them? Uh, so we had a, a wonderful casting director, Kate Ringsell, um, and <clears throat> um, again through the pandemic, uh, we saw um, through Kate hundreds of self-taped auditions, um, which I think is a really good way of seeing kids as well. And uh, they can they can shoot a, a scene at home, you know, on a mobile phone with their parents or with with a drama teacher or a brother or a sister or somebody that they feel comfortable with. They can do as many takes as they like, only send one. Um, and, uh, and, and there's just less pressure on it. Um, and it means that we can see lots and lots of kids and then kind of have an initial whittle and then do recalls. And those recalls happened on Zoom. Um, and th they ended up being chemistry re reads on Zoom, which sort of just felt completely illogical initially to me in that the idea of a chemistry read is that you've got people in a room together and you see how they work together. Um, and uh, we weren't able to do that because of the, the, the pandemic, but um, I found that it worked really well and the kids were very comfortable working like that. Um, and we were able to swap kids in and out on the screen, you know, from different parts of the country and even, you know, in the States uh, for, the, for the young uh, adults who were auditioning for the role of, of Abe as well. Um, so yeah, we were able to just kind of move people around and you know, uh, see how they will work together, but on a screen, and actually that felt very comfortable and put less pressure on those situations. And then finally, uh, I've got to ask you about the scene uh, with the children, uh, two of them on a tractor, driving at speed, uh, through a bumpy field, must have been a heart in your, a heart in your mouth kind of moment <laughs> with them doing that. Well, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of working out that happens during during a film and um you know we as is often the case we didn't have an enormous amount of time um and we didn't have an enormous amount of money um and uh certain scenes that look like they're going to be tricky there's always a bit of pressure on those scenes and a bit of an axe hanging over them and uh people who would maybe like to see those scenes cut from the film because they're they're tricky to shoot um and uh, and maybe the tractor scene was one of those, but uh, I think you know certainly myself and producer Gemma felt strongly that that we wanted to keep that, um, and we found a way of making it work. Um, but um, it's it's not as uh, it's not as hairy as you might imagine, um, and a tractor only goes four miles an hour, <laughs> uh, and so we almost made a virtue of it, had a bit of a joke out of that, um, and it is on a rig as well. So he's not actually driving it. Okay, thank you very much. And then finally, actually one last thing, Railway Children 3? Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, see, I imagine the producers will see how, how well this one does first. <laughs> it's a lovely film, thank you very much. Cheers.